Yes, I don't think anybody I know on the left thought this was the big crunch for the left, yeah? I mean, of course, any crisis is, in a sense, an opportunity for the left, any crisis of the system. But I don't know, I, I didn't see anybody on the left leaping around and saying, ah, the system is collapsing. Clearly not, you know. It is formidably strong. But I do think this, that... Um, what happened was actually very ironic because the, one of the reasons for the crisis, the economic crisis of a few years ago, is that the capitalist system was really out of control. And one of the reasons it was out of control was because it had won in the Cold War. Yeah? This was a kind of post-Cold War triumphalism. And the economy at that time was okay, basically. So, it, the system overreached itself. It thought it could do anything. And that brought about the crisis. But the irony is that the same overreaching, uh, the same triumphalism, drove back the left. Yes? So that in those years, um, the left was on the back foot. The left was, was rolled back. And people were talking about the, the death of history, the end of the left, you know, and so on. And what that meant was that but when, the, when the crisis arrived, the left was in no shape to deal with it. Yes? Um, the crisis and the rolling back of the left were created by the same movement in the system. So, you know, of course there were helpful, hopeful signs, the, uh, the Occupy movement and, and others, but, um, you know, I personally didn't expect that we would see socialism at the end of this crisis. Well, as usual, the left is fragmented, um, which is not surprising, because if you have to fight a formidably hard system, then that will be demoralizing, yeah? And people will begin to split or leave or... Uh, at the same time, as I say, there are some very hopeful signs. Um, uh, the, the crisis didn't go unchallenged. You know, there have been organized movements. Um, to resist it. Uh, there have been some interesting political developments in Latin America, for example. Um, there's been the Arab Spring. It is actually quite extraordinary if you think how much history has happened since the millennium, since 2000. You know, the, the World Trade Center, the war on terror, the economic crisis of global proportions, the Arab Spring. All that happened just at the moment when some ideologues in the West will say everything's finished, you know, they were so uh, smug, so triumphalist, say in the 1990s, and it, when they'd won the Cold War, that they thought actually the whole of history was over. That's a very rash prediction to make because normally when people say that, history breaks out again in a big way, and that's exactly what happened. <laughs> Are they really new? Well, What's new? Uh, no, 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 nothing is entirely new. Nothing is entirely new. There is no pure originality. Everything is constituted in part by what came before it. Yeah. So I don't believe in absolute breaks. I don't believe in absolute novelty. 
I think what happened was that the, in the face of the crisis, the left had to try and discover some new forms. It had to experiment. Sometimes that worked, sometimes it didn't work, as one would expect. Yeah? It was feeling its way in a new situation. Um, and that, I think, is still, is still the situation. Um, there were some, I mean, put it this way, you might say uh, crudely that what happened on the left was a shift from Marxism to anti-capitalism. Yeah? Now, that's not a huge shift. <laughs> that's not an enormous leap. <laughs> Uh, I'm not that concerned personally about whether people are Marxists or what they mean when they call themselves Marxists, you know. But certainly that they should resist this system. That seems to me to be vital. And here and there, sometimes more successfully, sometimes less successfully, that's, that's what's going on. But Well, some, some do, some say that, and some don't say that. You have to discriminate, you know. Um, my eldest son is a member of a movement called UK Uncut, which is an active movement against tax evasion by large companies. They occupy the, 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 the venues, the places, the buildings of these companies. Um, that, I, I wouldn't call that a Marxist movement, uh, no reason why it should be. But it's certainly not politically neutral. You know? It is very much against the system. I don't think it's true to say that all of these mo movements are neither left nor right. That's true of some of them. But there is a left. It's, 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 it's inevitably been weakened by the sustained assaults on it ever since the days of Reagan and Thatcher. Because really we have to trace this crisis back and say there was a moment in the 1970s where the left felt itself to be in the ascendancy. A lot of exciting things were happening, you know. I mean, nobody was talking about revolution around the corner, but, you know. What happened then, in, back in the 1970s, was a crisis of the system. And that produced Reagan and Thatcher and sustained assaults on the labor movement and on the trade union movement. And the left is still suffering from the hangover of all that. So that when an even larger crisis broke out, some years ago, as I say, it wasn't in good shape to deal with it. Oh no, I didn't say that. I said that some of what you say about some movements being neither left nor right is true, but it's not true of all of them. There are also movements, UK Uncut, anti-tax evasion movements, anti-corporate movements, um, uh, envir left environmentalist movements, left feminist movements, which would most certainly see themselves as political. Is, um, is, is, is self-evident um, uh, because there is no, I mean socialism, socialism doesn't of course criticize what we have now because it's democratic, it criticizes because it's not democratic enough, yes, that's what socialists complain about in liberal democracy that, you know, having elections every four or five years, electing a lot of corrupt and self-interested people who will then govern your lives. I don't call that democracy. Socialism is about the extension of democracy beyond the ballot box, beyond the parliament, into the lives of, into the everyday lives of people. Only that kind of democracy, I think, will be strong enough to resist the powers that, that, uh, that we have around. Yes, I mean, I'm not, I'm not what Lenin called an ultra-leftist, which he, as you know, described as an infantile disorder. Ultra-leftism is the kind of leftism that abstains from all electoral or parliamentary uh, activity, you know, in a kind of rather morally self-righteous way. No, no, I mean, um, if one can achieve gains through the electoral system, politically and so on, then, then that's fine, and, and that's important. Um, but we have to remember... Um, and, and certainly this is going right back to the 1970s. Sorry if I'm getting a bit nostalgic about that. We have to remember that the only thing that can in the end defeat a system where some people grow obscenely rich and others are rummaging in, in garbage cans, only thing in the end that can defeat that is a mass movement. 
and you won't get a mass movement out of the ballot box, uh, out of you know elections, though elections may well play their part in that. I don't, um, I'm not terribly excited by the topic of reforming the European Union. Maybe we can, maybe we can't, but I think we've got more interesting things to do. You use what you can. I mean, there's, there's a good kind of pragmatism, uh, and there's also a bad kind of pragmatism, which says, look, you know, don't, don't be, as we say in England, you know, holier than thou. You know, don't don't be self-righteous. I mean, if you can, if you have opportunities to work, even if it's compromising, even if you have to work with people you don't much like, then you know that's the way that's the way politics is. I don't think we should be misled by some fantasy of purity in that regard. And what, what around that? Isn't it? But I think that's a mistake. You see. Um, Revolution isn't defined by violence. Um, there have been non-violent revolutions. Um, there have been revolutions in our own time that have been surprisingly free of bloodshed. I mean, think of the way that the neo-Stalinist states in Eastern Europe were undermined. Yes, there was some violence inevitably, but there was nothing, nothing like the violence that this system is now perpetrating in Afghanistan or has perpetrated in Iraq, you know. Um, there have also, let's, a very important thing to remember, I think, is that reform, social reform, most of the reforms that we now take for granted, yes, were achieved, uh, there was a lot of blood shed in those reforms, yeah. Some processes of reform, think of, say, the civil rights movement in the United States, have been bloodier yeah, than some processes of revolution. You know, there are things that we call velvet revolutions, yes, as well as violent ones. The guarantee, for, I think for Marx and for Marxist thinkers, the guarantee, uh, Marx very much wanted, hoped for peaceful revolutions. He thought that was probably going to be possible in Germany. He thought it might be possible in Britain. But the guarantee of it is, um, once again, is really democracy. If you have a truly mass movement, then any process of radical social change is going to involve violence. But uh, if you're confronted with a mass movement, I think that diminishes the possibility of violence. We're not talking about a coup d'etat, you know, a, a swift, violent overthrow of a government. Well, revolutions are processes that take centuries. The bourgeois revolutions, of which we are the products, unfortunately, took a great deal of time to establish themselves. Um, governments... Um, even coercive governments have to some extent to appeal to the willingness of the people to be coerced. You know, it's a strange uh, paradox, but it's true, I think. Um, you can't just repress all the people all the time. You know? um, so even coercive governments require some degree of perhaps passive complicity on the part of the people. And the, 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 the bad news for the left is that as long as governments are able to get that amount of complicity, then they will carry on and people will tend to accept them. They may not like them, but, you know, because of the dangers of change and the obscurity of change, then it's natural, it's rational for people in that situation to say, OK, I'll settle for what I'm getting. You know, it's not the, it's not the paradise, but I'll settle for it. The good news, which is the other side of that story, is this. The moment such a power can't provide adequate satisfaction to a majority of people, they will rise up against it as night follows day. That's what happened with apartheid in South Africa. It's what's happened in Latin America. It's what happened in Eastern Europe and so on. So that you, one has to be realistic, see the two sides of the story. Yeah, I mean, if there's nothing in it, you, look, if people are going to be oppressed, there has to be something in it for them, you know, however small, which means that they will put up with it. Perhaps because the, the alternative is too obscure, is too dangerous, yeah. 
And the Arab Spring will be an example. Once those governments were unmasked as utterly corrupt or autocratic, authoritarian, there was nothing in it for ordinary people to accept that. Now that doesn't mean that, that, they, that, that you're going to be successful. It doesn't mean necessarily that you will replace those governments with, you know, some more decent kind of government. But unless you try that, you will certainly not create anything new. And he wasn't always right, any more than any thinker in human history has always been right. Marx made, of course, lots of mistakes. You know, I mean, his predictions were awful, dreadful. He was always got them wrong. Um, all I'm saying is that what the book does is it says, look, let's look at what Marx's critics say about him. What, what, what are the, the worst things they can say? And I, I go through them one by one, and I try to show that in almost every case they are completely mistaken. Yes. In other words, Marx has been more of a caricatured figure than I think any other thinker in the modern period, even more than Freud. Freud's pretty caricatured, but not so much as Marx. Um, uh, and of course, there's a lot of self-interest, political interest behind the caricature, but I think there's also a lot of ignorance. People really do think, or some people think, that Marx was an iron determinist, that he believed in a strongly centralized state, that he only believed in, um, you know, blue-collar factory workers as the agents of change, um, that he was a utopianist who dreamt up blueprints for the future. All of those things are completely mistaken. And the book goes through, you know, some other positions to try and show the same thing. And Dobbins. Well, I mean, lots of people, and a mixture of uh, ignorance and prejudice. I, I uh, know from my own experience that there are probably no limits to which some people on the political right won't go in order to, um, uh, to caricature, to distort, to vilify, and so on. You know, if I write a book, I can tell you now the journals in which it will be vilified, you know, even before they've read it, okay? And the left is used to that treatment, yeah? I mean, it, it's very depressing because it means that there is a deep intellectual dishonesty there, you know? At least one might, one might expect a conservative, an anti-Marxist to say, okay, okay, I accept that you're right about this, but I still reject it. That's fine. That's fine with me, you know? Um, but to put up a, what we call a straw target, to, to, to put up a caricature of a thinker or a position or a case and then to knock it over is useless. It gets you nowhere at all. Whenever one's trying to argue against a case, and this certainly is what I try and do when I'm cons confronted with a conservative case, I try to, I try to do it justice. I, I try to attack it at its strongest point. You know, or as they say in England, I try to give the devil his due. Yeah? Because there's nothing to be gained out of simply setting up a ridiculous distortion of somebody's case and then having the self-righteous pleasure of knocking it over. It's, a, it's an empty exercise, but I'm afraid it's an exercise that the political right indulges in quite a lot, and that's one reason why I wrote my book. himself is not, a, not a, a clairvoyant. He is not interested in peering into the future. He's a prophet, and the prophet is different from the clairvoyant. The clairvoyant tries to foresee the future. The clairvoyant, the prophet, the clairvoyant tries to foresee the future. The prophet says, look, if, if you don't change your ways in the present, there's not going to be a future, or at least it's going to be a very unpleasant future. So I'm not in the business of gazing into crystal balls. I'm not in the business of saying, you know, in five years' time, this will happen. If I said that, the right wing would say, ah, so you're a determinist. You think the future is determined. If the future were determined, nobody would need to, to struggle politically, you know. I mean, how can Marx be a determinist and believe at the same time that people have to struggle for justice? I think that in five years' time, after this crisis, that will, that will continue. 
Um, the system is already in some parts restabilizing itself. It is in the United Kingdom, where I come from originally. But, you know, as, um, as, as, as Bertolt Brecht once said, um, the only reason to despair is when there is oppression and no resistance. Yes. If you get oppression and you have no resistance, then, then you can begin to say, OK, they've won. Yeah. But as long as resistance goes on, and it is extraordinary over human history how deep-seated the human rage against injustice is. It may not win. It may not be successful, all, but it, it is, it's very, very difficult, if not perhaps impossible, for political systems to eradicate, to destroy the, um, the hunger for justice which will, you know, people will feel that hunger for 30, 40 years, for a lifetime. Yeah? And the left has a memory. It has a memory of those who have fought and struggled and sometimes died in the cause of justice. And it is not, it, it is not going to betray those people, you know. If we say, oh, well, we will call it off. It is not up to us simply in the present to call off this project. This project has involved too many dedicated men and women in the past for us to have the arrogance to say, okay, it's over. 